Next on the news. The search for survivors growing desperate. Florida struggling to get by while others take advantage. I would not want to chance that if I were you, given that we're a Second Amendment state. Looters beware. And remember the synod process that started last year? Well, we're at the halfway mark and we are due for a synod scan. Plus this. It's the timeless tune of tradition, but for many churches, those capable of keeping the melody are dwindling. I'm Christine Persichetti. Cars News starts right now. It's been nearly a week since Hurricane Ian decimated communities in Florida. There have been at least 100 deaths and the search for survivors now growing more desperate by the minute. This is a look from the ground at Fort Myers Beach. Hurricane Ian's winds combined with the storm surge chewed through homes and businesses, sparing nothing in its path. Massive devastation, something somewhat used to my first deployment actually was Hurricane Katrina. So um, seen a lot of hurricanes over the years. This certainly is a big, big disaster. Jennifer Brown is a canine search specialist with Florida Task Force 2. Her dogs Fierce and Fame are searching for human remains here on Fort Myers Beach. They've worked dozens of missions since Florida's Task Force 2 first arrived at Fort Myers Beach as the storm was still pounding this community. It was a good day. You know, I mean, again, it's like you, you know, you don't want to leave anybody behind. That's what we're here for. But then on the other hand, we didn't find anybody else. It's a good thing. A team of 80 from this task force have been busy crisscrossing a seven mile stretch on the beach, working 24 seven, going house to house in search of survivors. We found a lot of residents who are still sheltering in place, who need some info, need, need some help just getting out or just where to get water, ice, food, and just even just giving that information to them is a huge help for them. It's no easy task given the scene here. Homes crumbled, smashed, and stacked on top of others. Businesses blown to pieces. We had about uh, 60 medical calls, medical emergencies that we responded to with two people who actually went into cardiac arrest, stopped breathing, and those search and rescue personnel ended up performing CPR, able to get a pulse back and get them transported to a local hospital. There's no power or water in the Fort Myers Beach area, so anyone still there is completely cut off from services. John Lavenberg, national correspondent for the Tablet and Crux, is on the ground in the Diocese of Venice, which includes Fort Myers. He joins us now. Hey, John. Hi, Christine. So, John, tell us about the destruction that you're seeing. You know, what do the neighborhoods look like as you drive through? Yeah, so Christine, right now I'm at St. Leo the Great Parish in Bonita, Florida, uh, and I can tell you on the way here, driving through Venice, driving through Northport, different places, you can certainly see the destruction of what Hurricane Ian left. We, I actually, the person I rode here with, we pulled into different neighborhoods, a lot of neighborhoods with mobile type homes, not really secure houses, um, where the destruction, you can see a lot of things blown away, a lot of the belongings of people from inside their homes out on their front lawns destroyed, um, and the same thing, you can see gas stations out of gas, signs destroyed, trees down. So really, all along the way here, a lot of destruction. Oh, I can imagine. And, and how is Catholic Charities helping the victims now? I see something behind you. And what's their plan for the long term? So Catholic Charities for the Diocese of Venice, they really have response stations set up throughout the diocese at different parishes. So the one right here at St. Leo the Great, you know, they have a drive through where people come get water and food. Inside, you can also go in and do a FEMA intake uh, to get FEMA relief, and they also have blankets and different things. Where I was earlier today um, is really their biggest operation out of a parish in Northport, where they're partnered with the National Guard. They've had 13 semi-trucks come with ice, water, uh, tarps, different things that people have driven through. There were, I can tell you, there were thousands of cars that went through there today. So that's really what they're focused on right now is at all these different places. Arcadia is another, um, Fort Myers, Cape Coral, all these places really getting that immediate relief to people in this drive-through manner so it's quick um, and people can get it as they need it.
Yeah, we see someone right behind you now getting their supplies. Now, Florida is known as one of the least affordable places to live in the country thanks to inflation and soaring rental costs. So what does this mean for people with low or fixed incomes who have lost their homes? How is Catholic Charities going to help them? Yeah, Christine, like you mentioned, you know, there are a lot of people here on those fixed incomes living in those mobile types homes that I mentioned that were really ravaged and destroyed by the storm. Um, what Catholic Charities is doing right now is they're working with their schools and they have a list that's by the end of the day, they said it's going to be about 200 people deep of people that were either total losses their homes or severely damaged. And so what they're doing is organizing that list based on the severity, based on different things, income level, different ways to assess who's in most need here. And what they're going to do is they have contracts right now that they're sending to those places to help get immediate fixes to those things that are in need and in the and so from there they move through that list and then after that they have something called rapid rehousing they partner with the state with that they've done even before the hurricane now they're going to try and expand that to this hurricane relief they partner with landlords different places to get people that lost their homes in immediate places partnering with landlords like I said different people to get people on their feet and in a secure housing situation uh, you've been making your way down the Gulf Coast, and tomorrow you have plans to head with Catholic Charities into the homes of survivors. So do they plan to rebuild? You know, Christine, my understanding is tomorrow I'll be spending a decent amount of time seeing these homes in Fort Myers, where, as you know, uh, the storm really ravaged Fort Myers, Fort Myers Beach in particular. And so these people, all the indication is the reason we're going is to bring a contractor to show them the type of destruction that exists and the type of rebuilding that needs to be done. So it seems that these people that we're visiting, they plan to stay. These are members of the Catholic school community that we'll be visiting first and in the most need. They plan to stay and want to rebuild and stay here. We have been seeing horrific pictures from Fort Myers Beach. John Lavenberg, national correspondent for the Tablet and Crocs. Thanks so much. We'll check back in with you tomorrow. Thank you, Christine. As John explained, the extent of the damage and the number of people who lost their homes is only beginning to come into focus. Some people are saying that staying in their water ravaged home is their only option. Let's take a closer look at what could become the nation's next housing crisis. More than 2 million households in Florida with incomes below $50,000 pay more than 30% of their income in rent or mortgage. That's more than a quarter of the total households in the state. On top of that, in the counties that were under evacuation orders, less than 20% of homes have flood insurance. Are you looking for some way to help? The Diocese of Brooklyn has set up a fund if you want to donate. The proceeds will not only go to Florida, but to Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic as well. Just make a check payable to the Compostela Fund of the RC Diocese of Brooklyn and mail it to Diocesan Finance Office, 310 Prospect Park West, Brooklyn, New York, 11215. As if the storm wasn't bad enough, one Florida county will be underwater again, and this time it's not only because of the hurricane's high waters. In Osceola County, the floods are subsiding in some spots and rising in others, thanks to someone with apparently nothing better to do. Authorities believe an outfall pipe was vandalized, and now it's adding fuel to the fire, causing several neighborhoods to flood faster than expected. Many people came home after Ian only to leave again. The county issuing a number of evacuation orders. Police department locked on our, our doors to say that the East Lake may overflow. We have city staff and volunteers going door to door to notify residents and give them any assistance they need in evacuating. FEMA, the Red Cross, and a number of nonprofits are assisting the residents setting up stations at community centers to help the evacuees. Waters are expected to be at their highest for days, especially from October 7th to the 12th. Flood alerts aren't the only warnings being issued. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis telling looters to think twice before they act. Authorities arrested four people for ransacking unoccupied homes and businesses heading in right after the storm. But according to jail records, the team of troublemakers was already released after posting a $35,000 bond. DeSantis says that outcome is only for the lucky ones. I can tell you in the state of Florida, uh, you never know what may be lurking behind somebody's home. And I would not want to chance that if I were you, given that we're a Second Amendment state. More than 35% of Florida's population owns a gun. 
Well, the results are in. The Holy Father now has a working document from everyday people in his own hands. The so-called synod listening sessions were his personal request. And the new document details Catholics' hopes and needs for the future of the church. It's a big one. And that's all thanks to a special group that sifted through hundreds of reports from all over the world. The process started one year ago in Brooklyn, which means we are officially at the halfway mark. So now we need a checkup, a synod scan, so to speak. Just how are we doing in this marathon? Current News Jessica Easthope tells us we are on pace, but the church here will never be the same. The important themes and topics of the synod. While the average parishioner might think the synod process is over for the Diocese of Brooklyn, Sister Marianne LaPiccolo says now is when the real progress begins. This is the beginning of a long, long process of rebuilding the church and getting people back. Thousands across Brooklyn and Queens participated, nearly 1,000 digitally. A report on the listening sessions was due over the summer, and now the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops is reviewing how Catholics feel about their church. And that's the key. Can we create inviting, welcoming communities of faith so that people want to be part of us? In Brooklyn and Queens, people want more faith formation for young people and families. They also want a focus on the area's diverse populations. The Diocese of Brooklyn is the most diverse diocese in the country. Masses are said in 33 languages. The challenge is how do we make this one parish community? And then how do we build community um, within the parish so that people know one another? Bishop Brennan said what struck him most about the synod process is how passionate people are about their faith and church community. And we don't live in Catholic bubbles. What people are looking for is to make that connection. They want their faith to be able to sustain them and help them in the living out of their daily life. Over the next year, the Brooklyn Diocesan Report will become part of larger national and then continental reports. And just like the church itself, the goal for the Synod is ever evolving. What he wants this to be is an ongoing process of discernment, the journeying together as church. And that happens in every age, with every age group, in every culture, in every corner of our world. The Diocesan Synod Report will be released on Wednesday, October 13th. In Prospect Heights, Jessica Easthope, Currents News. The Synod is foremost about meeting people where they are, going out and hearing from the peripheries. The worldwide process sought to hear from everyone, especially people who have felt a disconnect from the church. It's time to, to let that this richness of those persons with disabilities emerge in the life of the church. When we get back, we speak with a Vatican official who works with people with disabilities and what they want the Pope to know, they hand-delivered it. That's coming up on Currents News. There's a lot more news headed your way. Moving the migrants, New York City forced to switch gears in its plan to house the newcomers, where they're being placed now. Plus, he rode and rode and rode his boat all the way from the Big Apple to the Emerald Isle and later. The music is in the service of our worship. Why the soundtrack of our worship may soon fall silent. We've got a shortage to tell you about. There are now some big changes to the tablet website. You can get personalized access to the Catholic news you value. Sign up for free at thetablet.org. Back to one of our big stories tonight. We are halfway through the synod process and Catholics in all corners of the globe are taking part, including Catholics with disabilities. They even hand delivered their report to Pope Francis. Vittorio Scalzo from the Vatican Department for Laity, Family and Life was part of that effort and he joins us now. Hi, Vittorio. Hi, hi to everybody. So, Vittorio, you said that you hope the Synod changes the mentality of the church when it comes to the disabled. Why does it need to change? Well, the church has been very active in the past and in the present to take care about persons with disabilities. We know that the church has loved persons with disability and took care of them. Now it's time to listen. And uh, it's time to listen to them, and the Synod journey is the perfect time to start 
doing something different, giving them the possibility to talk, to express their personal views in the synodal process. Why did it take so long to start this conversation? Sometimes we have to be sincere that there is some prejudice. They cannot fully understand. They are not even equal to us. Please consider what happens to the sacrament. There, there are many parts of the world where sacraments are not given to persons with disability, to person, especially to persons with intellectual disabilities. So something has, needs to change. And the first step is to recognize that they are part of our same family. Absolutely. I didn't know about the sacraments. So, so what were some of the takeaways from the synod held by disabled Catholics across the world? Well, uh, we started, uh, we started uh, some meetings with persons with disabilities and we understood that there was a great, a great desire to be taken seriously. Uh, to be taken seriously, not to be set apart, but to be part of the journey. And we discovered also that there are stories of persons who are really engaged in the life of the church, who already bring their own, uh, their own experience, their own, own apport, to the, apport to the life of the church. And it's time to listen. It's time to, to let that this richness of those persons with disabilities emerge in the life of the church. We, we are accustomed to uh, put together disab disability and sadness. We discovered that there is a full of joy in the life of many persons with disability. Right. We only have a short time left, so tell us quickly about the new campaign, hashtag I am church. Well, I Am Church is a campaign that we launched exactly one year ago in order to tell, to, to let them tell, I am church, I am part of the church. And uh, uh, we let uh, some five people with disability, uh, with disability to, to tell their story, story of engagement, story of joining, of belonging to the church. Sounds like a wonderful campaign. Vittorio Scalzo from the Dicastery for a Laity Family and Life. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. It's a favorite feast day for many across the globe, and it's not only parishioners celebrating, so are their pets. A parade of pets for St. Francis of Assisi, the patron saint of animals. And blessed are our furry friends. Look at these guys, so cute. Churches around the diocese invited pet owners to bring in their animals for a special blessing, asking the Lord to grant them good health and to keep them from harm. The most common blessed animals are dogs, but as you can see, other furry and feathery friends came too. Now, if you and your pal missed the Blessing Tuesday, don't worry, there's still a chance. Two churches in Brooklyn are doing blessings this weekend. Just show up outside St. Teresa of Avila Church at 563 Sterling Place at 3 p.m. on Saturday, October 8th, or be outside the Co-Cathedral of St. Joseph at 856 Pacific Street at the same time on Sunday, October 9th. And bringing together both people and pets, St. Mary, Mother of Jesus Parish in Bensonhurst held a block party over the weekend. The rain didn't stop around 200 people from gathering into the lower church and taking part in fun and games and giveaways. And in honor of the St. Francis Feast Day, they held a pet costume contest judged by their parish school's seventh graders. Look at that. That dog dressed as a taco there. There he is ironically called Chewy, won top prize. Awesome. Rain and flooding over the weekend has washed out New York City's plan to house migrants in a massive tent development in the Bronx. Mayor Eric Adams is now relocating and downsizing the proposed tent city to Randall's Island, ditching the already under construction site on the flooded Orchard Beach that would have housed 1,000 migrants. Instead, the new site will only have enough room to house 500 people. Despite this, the mayor claims the move won't hinder his deadline, saying in part, we expect this site to open in approximately the same time frame as the originally planned location and we continue to build out our options and explore additional sites as we handle this humanitarian crisis created by human hands. 
The mayor's decision came just hours after community groups protested the original Bronx location, many voicing worries that it would exacerbate the resources in the area and increase local crime. And some saying the tent city would take away from the one waterfront park in the Bronx. Still to come on Currents News, you can bet Irish eyes are smiling after an Irishman made history rowing from New York to Galway, why he had to be rescued at his destination, and why an iconic sound in church may soon go quiet. Do you have a story idea or want to share a tip? Email us at newstips at desalesmedia.org or call our 24-hour number 718-517-517. 3122. We'll be right back. From the shores of New York to the cliffs of Galway, a treacherous 112 day journey we first told you about on Currents News is now complete. Damian Brown became the first man to row that route across the Atlantic. He says the journey was a fight from start to finish. He even had to be rescued in the final stretch after heavy rain and winds forced his boat to hit rocks, but still he made it, calling it a special moment to finally see his family and friends. Now he asks, would you take that journey? No thanks. Here's another question. What would mass be like without an organ? For centuries, it's been the sound of Catholicism, but lately the pipes have gone quiet. Churches across the country have been struggling to keep the melodies alive. Lindsay Stenger tells us there's a shortage of organists and in Green Bay, Wisconsin, they're fearing the day the music dies. In choir lofts across the country, one regal instrument beckons with the timeless tune of tradition. To have an organ which is so majestic, the, the king of the instruments as it's been called. For centuries it has been a staple in the Catholic Church, a worthy instrument of worship. So we really have all types of music, but the organ has pride of place. And for many, the pipe organ represents a vital companion to voices lifted up in community and communion. The purpose of liturgical music uh, is to lift the minds and the hearts to God. The music is in the service of our worship. But as time marches on, those capable of keeping the melody are dwindling on a somewhat alarming scale. 20 years and I've served in parishes large and small, uh, country parishes, suburban parishes, downtown city parishes, and the shortage of organists is very real. According to the American Guild of Organists, there are roughly 75 organists in the Green Bay area, but 169 parishes. Jody Sternad is one of the few that has chosen to keep the courts alive. Starting in ninth grade, she says the organ has been a part of her life longer than it hasn't. I've always had loved music, so that's been a, um, that's just been a part of my life. It is my life. 61 Keys played with passion. The organs are in a church, right? So when you're practicing in that, to realize that you may not have anybody else in the building, but you know God is there. And so you get to sing or play for him. Sorry. And a devotion so deep. That was Lindsay Stanger reporting. And as she mentioned, the American Guild of Organists says there are only 75 organists in the Green Bay area. That's less than half the number of Catholic parishes there. Wow. And that is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.